Hello, hello, Rabbi Yoni Katz here, Rabbi Manas, Freeman's biggest fan. We're continuing to explore this essential question of does God need our mitzvahs? Does God need us? Can we make any impact on him? Is he above all this? I found this great clip, this great class actually by Rabbi Sheistaub for JLI entitled, If God Didn't Need to Create Us, So Why Did He? Listen to how he starts off, and then we'll fast forward to a little later segment. I'll try to um, give some uh, of my explanations to show how Chabad Chassidus is actually taking this relationship between God and man to a whole new level of importance and how necessary it is to God himself in his very essence. The real question, the intelligent question, if you're an intelligent person at this point, what is on your mind? If God didn't need to create then why did he? That's a great question. If he didn't need to do it, then what did he do it? That's a good question. It's a great question. And if we can start to even talk about that question, we can understand a lot of other things because it all goes back to, I mean, Everything in this world goes back to why is it here? Why is it here? Why am I here? Who needed me here? And when we ask the question, does God need us? Or does God need our service? Or does God need our mitzvahs? Obviously, need is not the perfect word. You know, obviously, it's limited to language. But when you ask somebody, does God want us to do mitzvahs? Everyone across the board would say, of course God wants. And then if you ask, does God need the mitzvah, suddenly there's like a switch. Oh, no, no, God doesn't need anything. And obviously not only does asking the question in such a way start the conversation, but it tries to bring across a point of how intense and how essential we are and our mitzvahs are. So not only is it a conversation starter, but what does God how do we relate to God in any way? What does it mean that God needs? What does it mean that God's jealous? What does it mean that God's angry? So I think really what's what makes people uncomfortable when you ask the question is really what Rabbi Shea Taub, and we're going to skip a little later on to how he addresses it at a later point in the lecture. Of course, if you want to listen to the whole thing, I'll put a link in the description. And here we go. So you ask yourself a question. What am I doing here? Why am I here? You want to know the honest answer? It's uncomfortable. I mean, it's like kind of makes us squeamish. It's kind of like having to think about the fact that if you were born, your parents had to have at least once had some type of an intimate relationship. I mean, they don't like to think about it, but by definition, you know. Well, this is, this is deeper than that. Why am I here? How did I get here? Why is there a world? Because someone, and I'm saying someone, you know, hint, hint, wink, wink, Capital S on that someone. Because <clears throat> someone had a taiva, a lustful desire that he couldn't satiate. Someone, God, obviously, had a lustful desire that he couldn't satiate. Again, not my words, not Rabbi Manas Freeman's words. Rabbi Shea's Taub is explaining where we came from and how this whole thing started. Someone was in the mood for love. He was out for romance. That someone happens to be absolute existence. Absolute existence had a taiva. You know, I was, I was explaining this to uh, some yeshiva students. I was telling them about Hashem's taiva, God's taiva, his lustful desire, his... Uh, 
his his longing. So I said, uh, you know the difference between me and Hashem? I mean, there are a few differences, but one big one. <laughs> I'll tell you in Hebrew, and then I'll kill it by translating and explaining. <sighs> the difference between, between me and Hashem? All of his tithes are L'shem Shemayim. All of his desires are for the sake of heaven. See, I have a lot of desires too. Some are kosher desires for the sake of heaven, and some are selfish desires. But all of God's tithes, all of his passions and desires are for the sake of heaven. So you say, hold on a second, that's not fair. He is heaven. So of course all of his desires are for the sake of heaven. That's circular logic. So he has carte blanche, he is automatically justified because he's God, so he's doing everything for God's sake. Like you say to God, would you, would you cut that out for God's sake? Okay, right? It sounds funny, but the, 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 the truth is, there's a very sensible answer to all this. Of course all of his irrational, romantic desires are legitimate, are automatically holy and legitimate and need to be fulfilled. Need to be fulfilled. Again, he's focusing on the need to be fulfilled part. Not so with me. I have some deep desires that really don't need to be fulfilled. As much as I protest to the contrary, they don't need to be fulfilled. But with God, of course, all of his deep, irrational desires need to be fulfilled, ought to be fulfilled. You know why? Because we were saying before, he's absolute existence. In other words, he doesn't need anything to validate him. He's validated. He's the essence of validated. So when he wants something, desires something, longs for something, he really longs for it. It's no joke. And that desire, that passion is sufficient reason to create an entire world. In every life of every human who's ever lived, all to be part of getting that desire met. It's a, it's a tough one. I'm saying emotionally, intellectually it's not tough. Intellectually it's pretty, pretty clear, pretty straightforward. It makes more sense than any other explanation for why we're here. Emotionally it's tough. Why are we here? Because God had a desire. You know why it's emotionally tough? Because it forces us to admit God's vulnerability. And it forces us, and please forgive me here for a second, to look at God in a little bit of a human way. And I don't mean, God forbid, to look at God as a human. I mean to you to, to be in touch with your own humanity when you look at God. We're so impersonal with God, like he's this big giant machine. It's so not nice. All he wants is this romantic, intimate relationship with you, and you want to turn it into points. What do I get for this mitzvah? What, do I, what punishment do I get? How many demerits for that one? You want to make it all about reward and punishment. Is there reward and punishment? Yes, obviously there is. But that's not the motivation it shouldn't be the motivation for any mature person. Any adult shouldn't be motivated by the fact you're going to get paid. You have to get paid for it. It's not love. It's not intimacy. It 
if you need the reward, and if you fear the punishment. Just not nice to God. You're not being nice to him. It's cruel. Here he is being all vulnerable, and you're turning it into a business transaction. How about you respond to this vulnerable, romantic overture in kind? Oh, you really like when I take leather boxes with the Shema inside them, written on cowhide, and I wrap them on my arm and between my eyes? Okay, if that's what you like. He says, yeah, it melts my heart. Okay, if that melts your heart. It makes you crazy if you take wool and linen and you mix them together into one fiber that just, uh, I can't stand it, you know. Okay, I don't, I don't get it. A mitzvah is gratifying a desire. A mitzvah is telling the person who has the desire, or in this case, God who has the desire, you matter. In other words, I don't need you to intellectually defend the thing that you need. All I need to know is, is it's for you. So if my wife tells me that a particular dinner is her favorite dinner, I don't need her to explain it to me. I need to take note of it. And I don't have to argue with her and say, well, actually, you know, there, is much, there are many better dishes than that. Let me educate you. Let me make you more of an, an, a, a, a culinary uh, expert. Let me expose your, your palate to new... You know, you know what? You ruined it. You killed it. I told you what I like. Take note of it. What, what's the appropriate, what's the healthy response when somebody who loves you doesn't need you in a clingy, neurotic way? Someone who loves you and wants intimacy with you, tells you something that they like or they dislike. What's the appropriate response to that? Relief. That's a good answer. Anything you want, honey. And not that passive aggressive, <laughs> anything you want, honey. After you say the anything you want, honey, not just you say it, but you do it. And the lover knows that the beloved is going to respect his or her likes and dislikes. What's the next smart thing to say? They told you what you could do. You, they said what they like, and you said, okay, whatever you want, honey, I'll do it. But more the okay, that's that's of the same ilk. The next question is, tell me more about that. Why do you like that? But catch this, the order is so essential here. If they tell you what they like, and your first response is, why do you like that? That's not good. Because what does that mean? That means, and we can understand now why that's such a rejection, is because basically they're exposing a desire which has no rational defense, and you're treating it like a need, and you're putting them on the spot and say, argue it for me. Defend your need. Tell me why you like it. Make it make sense to me. But that wasn't a rational need. It wasn't a practical thing. It was a deeply meaningful, it was a personal thing I shared with you. I like it. I like it. So what's the appropriate response? Whatever you want, honey. Yes, yes, dear. Once they know that you're doing it, then you say, you know, I would love to know all about why that's meaningful to you. That's beautiful. You want to do, you want to fulfill my desires, and you want to know about me? Wow, this is great. I feel so accepted. I feel so close and connected. So when God gives us the Torah, 
meaning he reveals his likes and dislikes, he reveals his desires, the first appropriate response is, whatever you want, dear. And you can call God dear. That's absolutely fine. Desirable, good, healthy. In other words, to use language we might be more familiar with, is there is performance of mitzvot and study of Torah. So mitzvahs and Torah. Whatever you want, honey. And then after that, tell me all about that. Why is that so important? Why do you like that so much? That would be the appropriate, that would be the polite response, the, the decent response. Just, uh... So, <clears throat> obviously, uh, he said a lot there. And off the bat, it seems like he uh, clearly agrees with Rabbi Friedman. So uh, when people say that this is heresy or this is not legitimate according to Torah, as uh, I've stated many times, this is a deeper understanding of God through Chabad Chassidus. So obviously that's the first thing to know. Chabad Chassidus offers a much deeper, much more, more profound understanding of God. So if you don't learn it, and then you hear something that seems on the surface to counteract, you know, what you think according to Nigla, the revealed part of Torah. You have to uh, obviously sort of delve deeply into what this new approach is and understand it on a deeper level. The second thing, what he was saying that God has a desire and we shouldn't ask why. Um, one of the fundamental understandings of Chabad Chassidus is that this desire is not based on logic. You can't ask God, why do you want it? Because God himself doesn't have an explanation. It's not based on logic. It's coming from his very essence. So God can't defend it with a logical reason. He's saying, this is me, meaning God himself has no reason. And that is essential. So it'd be interesting to know, to ask Rabbi Taub, like, so could God not have this desire if it's lustful and deep and passionate and essential and everything and all the different words that were being used? It sounds like that he could not choose not to have the desire. And it seems that way in the Basi Lagani Mimers that the Rebbe says that this desire is loy lots moisey. This is his essence, meaning God in his essence is a yearning for this intimate relationship. This is him meaning it's even more important than his own existence in that sense. It's his very core, his very yearning, um, the very being of who he is. So obviously, according to that, he could not decide not to have this desire, which seems to be pretty evident. Um, obviously, there's so much to discuss. But one last final point. When we say that we should do a mitzvah, L'shem Shemaim, for the sake of heaven, meaning God, like he said, if you want me to put on the tefillin, I'm doing it for your sake, not by the reward. I'm doing this for you, not for what I can get for, from you, but who I'm doing it for. That means for, for God's sake. That means altruistic. So when God gives us the mitzvah, does it also work in the reverse way that God says, please, I want you to do the mitzvah, meaning for your sake. Once you do the mitzvah, now we're having this intimate relationship. Meaning God's not saying, here, can you do this mitzvah? And then I'm going to get a, a reward or a byproduct of, of a holy world or using you to get something. No, I'm doing it for your sake, meaning for you to have the oneness with you. So when people quote different sources and the Ramachal and says, and you ask them, does God need the mitzvah? No, God gave you the mitzvah for your benefit, for your sake. Meaning God's unaffected. No. What it's saying is meaning for your sake. God is sharing his deepest desire, which is you, which is the mitzvah. And by sharing with you, now he truly has you. Like he said before, Rabbi Tal, Bishvili, Nivra'il, the whole world was created for me. So God's not using me, just like we shouldn't use God to get schar or olam haba. So we're not using God. And God definitely is not using us. So when he give us, gives us the mitzvah, it's truly for our sake. For our sake, meaning not that he doesn't care about it, but he's perfect and he doesn't need something. 
but someone. And that truly is for our sake, not for something he's going to get from us. And that's what intimacy means, when you dissolve one into each other. Obviously, so much to discuss. Thank you, Rabbi Taub. And we shall continue.